Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to a, another episode of the Stride for the Love of Running webinar series. As always, my name is Evan. I'm your host for the series. Today, I am joined by Ian Berman. Ian, how are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you? Awesome. I, uh, I I finished my morning run. We got to chat a little bit before this, uh, so it's always good to, to catch up um, on stuff. I want to give a quick uh, plug just for anybody watching um, right now on YouTube or Facebook. If you have any questions during this, please feel free to submit them. Um, also, for anybody watching right now, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date for great webinar series like these. Um, Ian, we'll give you a chance to plug your own YouTube channel uh, here as we wrap up at, at the end. But I'm really excited to talk to you because uh, you're somebody that I've known for, for, for a bit. We've met in person at different expos, um, but you're in the uh, running media scene. You are a, uh, what is it, self-proclaimed running nerd gone amok. And I'm yeah. so excited just to talk about um, really kind of the heart of this series, the for the love of running uh, component. So um, starting off, again, want to do a quick intro. Uh, here, you're a master's athlete based in Portland, Oregon, uh, which is a pretty darn good uh, place to, to, to be in. Um, you have a YouTube channel called Running Otaku, where you cover running advice, how to structure training, running tech reviews, comparisons, and so much more. Uh, and again, I mentioned, uh, I, I just love the, the tagline in your bio on your YouTube channel, The Running Nerd Gone Amok. Um, we're going to talk about a couple different things today, and I think things that are very relevant all the time for runners, but things especially right now uh, in terms of structuring training, when you might be ready for a coach and when you might be ready to self-coach and then how to set goals, how to reflect on those goals too. So um, Ian, anything I missed in your intro or anything else you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, I think you covered a lot. So yeah, as you said, I'm a master's runner. Uh, when you're a master's runner, you're happy to get older. So this year I turned 50, which means I'm, I'll be in a new age group. So I'm mm -hmm. super excited about that. Such is the life of runners. And you're right, <laughs> living in Portland. So I moved here from Asia. I was living in Asia a few years before. And basically my choices came down to like many runners, where's a good place to run? So Boulder and Portland were at the top of the list. My wife likes green uh, and it's a little cheaper here. So we chose Portland. Sure, sure. I've been to Portland once, um, took a trip up to Pacific Northwest, visited, you know, the hot spots, Eugene, Portland, uh, Seattle area and stuff. Where is your uh, favorite place to run in town? So the most famous area is Forest Park, mm -hmm. right? It's a, uh, there's probably, I don't know, 40, 50 miles, you know, uh, uh, 80 kilometers of trails, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a pretty dense forest. So it's good all year round. It doesn't get too hot or too cold here. Mm -hmm. uh, it rains a lot, but you get protected by the trees there. Ah. So great place. It's it's kind of rolling hills, nothing too steep. So really good kind of long run day. Um, and then we have, there's two rivers that mm -hmm. crisscross the city. Uh, and there's a nice loop. It's about 10 miles or 16 kilometers around mm -hmm. uh, if you want to do something flat. Uh, so those are my two favorite places to run here. Awesome. I want to, but before we dive into everything, I'm always super interested in hearing how people got into running. So can you tell us when you started running, when you just uh, started getting into the sport? So I started probably when I was around five or six. Mm. Um, and that's because my dad uh, was a cardiologist and a runner. He uh, ran in college, University of Pittsburgh in the mm -hmm. 1940s and 50s, mm -hmm. <laughs> going way back, uh, and a lifelong runner, you know, training uh, 80 miles a week uh, for 30 years, four marathons a year, this kind of thing. Um, and I grew up in an area of Los Angeles called Palos Verdes, mm -hmm. which used to be pretty famous for running because it had the second longest standing marathon behind the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. called the Palos Verdes Marathon starting in the mid 60s mm. um, and the area of Palos Verdes is only like 80,000 people or so but very heavy running community um, and in fact in the 80s I mean this is uh, this I don't know if I should say this now because there's <laughs> there's a lot of people that are against us but in the 80s tons of elementary kids uh, junior high and high school kids running the marathon wow. and this is a hilly marathon probably 1500 feet of elevation change at least wow. um, 
And there were a number of eight, nine, 10 year olds running the marathons in the 70s and 80s in my neighborhood. So that's how I got started. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. It seems like um, nowadays, especially, and especially right now, as we reflect on maybe the, the state of you know global pandemic and stuff, there's been a lot of people picking up athletics again, but there are still a bunch of people um, you know, that have been lifelong runners that are, you know, still trying to train through. So um, that's probably the first point that I want to touch on, specifically in, in your case, as you've been a lifelong runner, you have experience with different types of training. And so um, training, we we usually look at training as a little bit different than just running, right? So you can get out the door and run, but when you're training, yeah you're focusing on specific goals, you might be working with a coach, you might be coaching yourself. So I just want to get your take and your experience um, and thoughts on different types of training. So uh, starting off, can you tell us about your experience uh, working with running coaches and your overall thought on working with a running coach? So it's funny, I've been running my whole life, but I haven't been running with coaches that much. So I ran for my high school team, mm -hmm. uh, track and cross country. We had a great coach who left after my sophomore year. Mm. And we had the math teacher come in to coach who knew <laughs> less about running than we did. Uh, so that's when I first started running a muck, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the terrible typical high school running where you sure. do 35 miles a week, either way too hard or way too slow or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had that, I tried to walk on in college. I, I ran my freshman year for University of Irvine, which at that time mm -hmm. was back to back top 15 division one in cross country. Mm -hmm. So they were good back then and I was two levels below. So I walked on and walked off quickly, um, but great coach. So I learned a few things then. Um, and, but from that point on, it was basically self coaching um, I've got a number of books, right? The Daniels Running Formula, you know, mm -hmm. Fitzinger, uh, all, all the usual suspects, and use those to varying degrees of success. And then about a year and a half ago, after I moved to Portland, I wanted to get serious in running um, and hired a coach, uh, Tom Schwartz, who you had on the show before, mm -hmm. um, and had really, really good results from that, learned a lot of new things. Um, I'm currently basically self-coach now, um, mm -hmm. running with the competitive masters team, mm -hmm. but I've taken a lot of what I've learned, mostly from Coach Swartz mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit from the books and put it together. And I think with experience, you learn what you're good at, what you're bad at, and it's a continual process of, of fine tuning the training. Totally. Can you tell us um, maybe one or two things that have been impactful just from maybe, you know, uh, from from Tom specifically, yeah. um, but just maybe the concepts you've learned that you just didn't know or you weren't familiar with when you were coaching yourself or reading books and stuff like that? So the first thing is consistency, right? Uh, Tom always talks about keep the ball rolling, right? Mm -hmm. That's the mantra. Um, and for me, I had always been a six day a week runner because I always needed that seventh day to recover. Um, and I just figured that's that's who I was. Mm -hmm. it took me about 40 years of running to figure <laughs> out what I was doing wrong was I wasn't doing my easy days easy enough, mm. right? And this is a mistake I think most beginner runners make and even for someone with a bunch of experience, that I just didn't take the easy days easy enough. I wasn't fully recovered. And that's mm -hmm. why I always had to take a day off. Mm -hmm. When I started coaching or running uh, with uh, Coach Schwartz, I was running seven days a week sometimes twice a day. I ran three, four months without missing a day, totally fine. And that's mm -hmm. because the easy days were really easy. Right. Um, and, you know, we talk about junk miles and I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of physiological benefits for running even slow, you know, it builds up your cardiovascular system and a number mm -hmm. of other things as well. Um, so that's one thing I learned was I'm not a six day a week runner. I'm actually a seven day a week runner. And I think mm -hmm. everyone could be as long as those easy days are easy enough. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, I've always been better at the shorter distances. Mm -hmm. So the mile, the 5K compared to a half marathon or full marathon. Mm -hmm. And again, I thought that's just because that's my makeup. You know, maybe I have more faster twitch muscles or something. Um, but I turn, it turned out that it wasn't the case. After training with the coach for a year, I realized just my, my uh, kind of threshold, uh, uh, I... Uh, lactic threshold was too mm -hmm. low. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the second thing I learned was the longer tempo runs are super beneficial. Mm -hmm. So in my case, when I was training for the marathon, I was doing a lot of tempo runs, probably about 
half marathon pace. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, five or six miles, half an hour, something like that. And over the course of a few months, it really changed me so that, um, where I used to be relatively weak on the longer distance, I was just as strong on the long distance as I was on the short. Mm, interesting. And then, and then one last one last thing I learned was um, no hero workouts. So just like don't make the make the easy workouts easy. Mm-hmm. On the hard side, uh, his philosophy, which I like, is your hard workouts are not a hundred percent effort. Mm-hmm. They're probably 95 percent effort. Mm-hmm. You know, he likes to say you should always feel like you can do one more rep, right? right? Uh, and I really found that to be the case. So toned down the the pace of my workouts just a little bit, got the quality in, uh, and it was really, really beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. Do you feel, um, you know, maybe with your experience in the past or talking with other, like like you mentioned, you're uh, running with competitive master's athletes right now on a team as well. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there's a point that you felt you were ready to hire a coach? So put a little bit more effort into um, learning about the sport, uh, treating things a little bit more uh, seriously in terms of training. I, I feel like some people might feel like they're competitive enough, but they don't think they maybe deserve a coach or they, they think they're not ready yet. Do you think that there's um, a line that somebody has to cross in terms of performance or what, what are your thoughts on when somebody might be ready to work with a coach? Uh, I think it's different for different people. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm naturally hard headed. And of course I always think I'm right. Um, and so I would I never wanted a coach because I figure who knows me better than me. Sure. Uh, right. Uh, mistake number one. <laughs> so I would say, um, If you're into, if there's a specific competition that you're really gunning for, Mm -hmm. um, or you've plateaued uh, and you're losing a little bit of interest in the sport because you just can't make it to that next level, Mm -hmm. and you just are banging your head against walks, you're doing the same things over and over, that's a clear indication that it's, it's time for a coach. Totally. Yeah, that's great. Um, we have a first uh, question that is rolled in here, and I would like for you just to talk about um, your case in particular and your experience. So the question is, how can one judge your easy uh, pace or power? What should be the upper barrier that shouldn't be crossed for easy days? I feel like that's a very individual question, but I'd love to hear um, your experience with with the range of what you consider easy, whether that be pace or power, heart rate, just your experience as an athlete. So, yeah. So, I mean, technically you can run at a certain percent of your maximum heart rate or of your CP, right? Um, But there's an easier test than that. Um, So I love numbers, but sometimes uh, I like the art as opposed to the science. Sure. Um, And you know you're running easy enough if you can talk in two or three complete sentences without huffing or puffing. Mm. So a lot of times we're running on our own. So talk to yourself out loud. Sure. And if you can't talk smoothly, you're running too fast. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, uh, What is? I guess it's the conversation check or something like that. Exactly, exactly. We definitely are looking forward to the time where we can run with other people and have conversations with other people too. I think that's a very good uh, range for, for, for easy as well. Um, kind of follow-up question here is, uh, you mentioned your uh, self-coaching more now. So you've taken some lessons. What is maybe the, you know, maybe that next point where somebody that might have been working with a coach feel like uh, they might be able to uh, self-coach and use that information they have from the past? Yeah. Um, so I think for, in my case, um, I, I use a coach for about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, because I learned, I learned about myself, and I learned some of the concepts that had kind of been holes in my knowledge base. Sure. Um, and I think you can continue on indefinitely with a coach uh, forever, and that's what the pros do, right? And they do sure. it for a reason because uh, there's a lot of accountability, and you're mm-hmm. al- always needing to tweak things. But in my case, at least right now, I decided to go back to self coaching because I learned the three or four things I need to work on, mm-hmm. and I want I like to. I like to uh, test things a little bit and tweak things. And I wanted to have the freedom to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, with a coach, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty a good student. So whatever the coach says, that's what I'll do. Sure. Um, and it didn't give me enough freedom to want to, you know, change a few things. So I'm mm-hmm. in the process now of, of you know, self-regulating and, and changing a few variables. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go back to a coach. 
Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great, great summary there. I want to uh, follow this up with the second topic we had here uh, of your experience with designing and following a training plan. So I think this can be multifaceted, right? So yeah. um, you had experience reading some books, constructing training plans in the past, and then uh -huh. you just talked about how you're a very coachable athlete. You like to learn yeah. from a coach. So you can follow a training plan. What is your experience with creating a training plan first and, and foremost? And how might you suggest people um, who usually maybe just print off, you know, a, a calendar that they get from, from, you know, a website or something like that, put it on the fridge or get, yeah. get an app, something like that? What would you recommend? So that's a great question. Um, I think for, for a lot of runners, uh, we're type A personalities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and planners. So you'll start a training cycle. You might have a target race and you'll be 12 or 14 weeks out. And then you, mm -hmm. you write your training plan and you get it off the Excel spreadsheet or the calendar and you put down every single workout and you hit every single workout. If you don't, you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't take into account, you know, that life gets in the way or you might get an injury, right? Sure. Uh, never happens, ever. Never. ever. <laughs> so that's what I used to do. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone there, right? Mm -hmm. You get that plan and you stick to it. Sure. Um, now what I do is a little bit different. So I still work backwards. So you've got your, your A target race. And mm -hmm. depending on the distance, you may start 12 weeks or 14 or 16 weeks back. Um, and what I do is I, I know for me, for each week, there's three things I want to accomplish. I want to do a long run. I want to do kind of a, a longer, uh, kind of tempo run. Like I said, to work on that threshold, mm -hmm. uh, lactate threshold, and then a, a little bit of speed. Mm -hmm. Um, and another thing I learned is I can recover pretty easily from the long runs and the longer tempos, but the speed workouts, I need an extra day. Mm. So when I create a training plan, I always keep that in mind. If I'm going to do a speed workout, I'm going to want two full days of recovery, mm -hmm. um, maybe three. If I'm doing a long run um, or a long tempo run, then one or two days might be enough recovery. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I, I do. And the other thing is I generally each week I'll write down before I, you know, as I'm writing the plan, how about how many miles I want and where I want the peak to be in the taper. So I'll put the miles there and the, types of workouts but i don't i don't want to get too specific mm. because the one thing i know for sure is that things change um and i may have to move things around on different days and i don't want to feel bad about having to change the schedule right totally. so i have an outline of this is what i want to accomplish for the week and the types of workouts i want to do but i keep flexibility because i may have to change things or may even heaven forbid to actually drop a workout entirely <laughs> so, mm -hmm. totally yeah. Where do you uh, where where do you get your information from? Do you uh, borrow workouts that you've seen posted online? Do you use past books that you've read, past interactions with coaches, friends, teammates? What is uh, kind of the inspiration for adding in those uh, you know all important workout sessions for you? So I think there's a few sources, right? It's always great to find your local running uh, store and mm -hmm. do group runs, right? There's mm -hmm. always some elders there that have a lot of experience and you'll learn some stuff, mm -hmm. some stuff they'll teach you. <laughs> Might be of questionable benefit, but in general, great sure. way to start. I think the second step is getting books. Um, let me see here, I'll turn. So so uh, I've used, so this is kind of one of the Bibles, right? This is the uh, mm -hmm. Daniel's running formula. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a great source. Some of the some of the training plans I think are a little bit too intense. Uh, you've got to be careful with those sure. uh, on the speed stuff. It's pretty tough. Um, I had great success when I first started running with Stride about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Of Jim Vance's book, The mm -hmm. Run with Power. Um, just a, there was one amazing thing in here, and I it was so hard for me to do. But he prescribes your long runs running for nine minutes and walking for a minute. Yeah. Um, which is sacrilege if you're a runner. <laughs> Walking is like the last thing you want to do. Um, but I ended up having great success with it, so I, I learned something new. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, Arthur Lydiard is another kind of uh, uh, old school coach, mm -hmm. right, from New Zealand. And I didn't read his books, but there's another one by uh, one of his disciples, Ken Livingston, right, mm -hmm. Running Healthy. Um, and this is good too. So I do recommend picking up a few books. Um, a lot of them cover similar ground, mm -hmm. so you can skim through those pages, but each of them has a little bit of a different take. 
And it's fun to see what they have and, you know, try it for a training cycle, see what works for you, what doesn't. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's totally um, great advice. I want to save uh, the master's discussion for the, the next topic, but I think there's a ton of impactful stuff specifically um, from the master's side that we can talk about this um, in particular. I would like to talk uh, now a little bit more about uh, preparation for a training plan. So yeah. um, I believe that you have uh, some stuff to share about goal setting and just how you review stuff. And uh, like, like we talked about, um, you're very experienced with running tech and, and comparisons and stuff like that. Um, so I, I'd love for you to be able to talk uh, a little bit more in depth specifically um, about how you go about setting goals. Because I think yeah. that's something that a lot of people probably don't do enough of. You You can have an idea, but actually setting a goal and yeah. like you're about to describe is a very powerful thing. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, if you're a new runner or you're below the age of 37 or 38, typically your goal is to set a personal best because sure. that's realistic. But once you get a little bit older, sometimes it's hard to go, you know, wind that uh, clock back 20 years to, mm -hmm. to achieve some of those goals. So you have to change it a little bit. And mm -hmm. um, if I can pull up the screen here, I can talk a little bit about my process here. So first, this chart it comes from the Daniels uh, running formula. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, it's an equivalence chart. So for example, if your best mile is seven minutes, seven seconds, that means for the 5k, you should be able to run 2408 mm -hmm. and 10k, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it gives you an equivalence of, of what you think you can hit. Mm -hmm. um, and I use this a lot because when I train, a, a lot of runners are specialists, there are marathoners, um, or maybe they're 10 K or they're mountain, you know, trail runners. Mm -hmm. I like to break up the year, uh, mm -hmm. kind of like going back into high school. So sometimes some parts of the year, I want to do marathon training. Mm -hmm. Other parts I want to work on my mile or 5k. Mm -hmm. So I actually set goals for the mile, the 5k, the 10 K and half and full marathon each mm -hmm. year. Um, and so here's what I did. So these blue are my lifetime goals, which, this one's out of reach. I'm never going to run a 437 mile again. Um, this 1634 is in play, though. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping um, I can come close to that. Mm -hmm. um, but here's what I did for 2018. So or at the end of the year, I looked at my best. I ran a 521 mile, an 822 5K, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I basically just wanted to improve each of those times, uh, You know, going down a few notches here. Mm -hmm. Um, so a 506 mile and a 1733, uh, 5k, etc. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, this kind of goes up, which means, like I said, I'm a relatively stronger, shorter runner mm -hmm. and my times are relatively weaker, the longer the race goes. Mm -hmm. So I took that into consideration as my 2019 goals. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the two things about runners are one, whenever you go on a race, it's never the right distance. It's always too short or too long, right? Mm -hmm. Never mm -hmm. run a race. That's the exact right distance. And two, we're never happy with our performance. Even if we set a PR, we can always feel like we have had a little bit left in general, mm -hmm. maybe once or twice in a lifetime, you feel like you laid it all out there. Mm -hmm. um, so when I set my goals, I take that into consideration. Um, and I actually set A, C, B, and A goals. So my C goal is what I think is, as long as I don't have any serious injuries or any crazy snafus, ambitious, but definitely doable. Cause I want right. to have some sort of feeling like, okay, I accomplished something. So right. I'll set my C goal. And then my real target is the B goal. This is what I train for. So when I start a training block, these are the times I'm shooting for my B goal. Mm -hmm. And then if I get to be about a month or so out before my target race and I'm feeling great, then I'm going to try and stretch it and actually try and hit the A goal. Totally. Um, so this way, when I run throughout the year, uh, it's not a matter of hitting a goal. It's not binary. It's not a yes or no. There's there's a range of goals in which I can feel kind of proud about. And so mm -hmm. in 2019, this is what actually happened. Mm -hmm. So my mile, I hit my B goal. Right, I wanted to run 509, it's B goal, I hit 507. Mm -hmm. And the 5K and the 10K, I hit my C goal, right? So that was pretty good. It wasn't the goal I was training for, but still not bad. Mm -hmm. The half marathon, I did great. Uh, and then we could talk about my Boston marathon was, I was, I was like in 257 shape at least. Uh, and 
I did everything you said not to do in your last <laughs> workout uh, and uh, ran a three eight, ran walked a three eighteen. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my that's my philosophy for goals uh, is kind of a C goal, which should be attainable to keep me motivated. B right. goal, and then if I'm really feeling great that day, go for the A. Yeah, I think that's um, that's something that I find really interesting because a lot of people maybe wrap themselves up in having one goal only. And that can be either extremely rewarding or it can be extremely demotivating uh, for, for the future, um, especially if, you know, at the beginning of a 12 week or 16 week marathon cycle, you have one goal and that's only to Boston qualify um, where a Boston qualifier for, you know, an athlete might be a 20 minute PR if they PR by 19 minutes and they still miss that one yeah. goal that they had, they consider it a failure, but that would be a, you know, an A minus or a B plus. I, I like to kind of look at this uh, screen that you're sharing now. Yeah. You were actually like pretty much dead in between your C goal and your B goal for your 5K, 1740 yeah. in between 1755 and 1729. That's yeah. a lot closer to the B side. So even being able to look at it in a positive like that, I think is extremely uh, powerful. I did, um, if you can go back to the uh, the, the V dot chart that you had before, yeah. um, in doing a little bit of uh, research for this episode, I think I saw, did you PR in a half in 2018 during a long run running like 130 for a half marathon during a workout long run? I, I did. So, so after my 5K training uh, that ended last summer, I was in really good shape. Mm -hmm. I And yeah, I hit, I hit a PR kind of in training. But then I actually raced one. Mm. And these are my actuals for 2019. So ah, okay. um, I ended up running a 121 half, which mm. blew me away because I thought on my best day I could run a 123. Mm -hmm. And what was super exciting is, as I told you before, I used to be this kind of runner where I would trend up. Totally. And this is right at my 5K. So it just goes to show you, just because you think you're a better short runner, you may not be. Mm -hmm. The coaching really helped. I did those threshold workouts. I got my time down here, which is equivalent to like a 250 marathon. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a goal for mine uh, after I turn 50 is to try and break 250 once mm -hmm. I start training seriously for that. But um yeah, I, I flattened out this curve here <laughs> uh, in a good way. And sure. um, so, yeah, it, it worked out really, really well. So um, if you have the ability to potentially go back and look at the A, B, and C, I believe you were showing the concept of age grading. And yeah. That is something uh, that I kind of want to tie into um, some of the questions that we we have here. So Dina asks, do you feel like intensity, not duration, is the key to high performance in masters runners? So I want to um, just talk a little bit about uh, some of the masters stuff right now because you bring up the concept of age grading, yeah. but answering this question yeah. uh, first, uh, do you feel like the intensity, not duration, is the key to high performance in masters runners? Yeah, the answer is both. You, you, you need both. So um, and Intensity and duration are great terms, right? Uh, mm -hmm. For when you're running with your power meter, right? It's mm -hmm. power and time sure. are really the two things. It could be pace and distance. You can use heart rate, et cetera, but you need both. Um, and that's not to say you need to maximize both. You need mm -hmm. to be smart about it. Um, like I said, when doing those real intense workouts, don't go to a hundred percent, especially if you're a master's runner mm -hmm. um, and you know, you're really pushing it. It's a very easy way for us to get injured. Um, so you need to dial it back a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, I always find in terms of duration, what, what I've been finding, at least in, for me now, I'm running probably 60 miles, between 60 and 80 miles a week. So mm -hmm. 100, 120 kilometers a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I find when I'm doing workouts, I like to get about 8K or about five miles of quality. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing a workout, that might be eight by one K. Uh, it could be a five mile tempo, but I find that amount of volume or that amount of duration works for me. Mm. Um, and it will be at different intensities depending on what the workout is, but you really need to take into consideration both um, in order to improve. 
Totally. I think that's a, a, a great question uh, or a, a great answer to a great question as well. Um, Pascal asks, do you have advice on how to find a good coach? So I'd open this up for general coaching, but then maybe um, specifically as a master's athlete too, is there anything that you look that you were looking for in particular um, or you might look for in the future, but any advice on how to find a good coach? The most important thing about finding a coach is someone whom you can respect uh, and follow. Because if you don't follow what they're prescribing, uh, then you don't know if it's, if you don't improve, you don't know if it's because the coaching was wrong or you just didn't follow it. Sure. Um, and in order to follow a plan, at least if you have a personality like mine, you need to really kind of respect that person and just unconditionally trust what they're gonna tell you. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I chose uh, Thomas Schwartz because he he's had a lot of success at both ends of the scale, both with the high school runners mm -hmm. and masters runners. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that was important because I aspire to be like some of the masters that he's trained. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, he understands uh, special issues that masters may have that a 20 something year old might not have. Right. Um, and so I think that context is really important. So understand where you are as a runner um, and, ask around your community about who has coached similar runners to success. Mm -hmm. um, and I think once you have bought in, uh, then you're really setting yourself up well to, to do well with that coach. Totally. How did you uh, personally, um, you know, uh, I, I guess, find Tom as a name, obviously yeah. um, for him in particular, be, like, like you said, we had him on um, and he's had a ton of success at the pro level, high school level, coaching masters runners. Yeah. Um, did you just put in a search engine and say running coaches or what, what was your kind of strategy? I did a little of that, but also from time to time I read Let's Run. So he's very, at least he sure. used to be very prolific on Let's Run, but he's mm -hmm. still quite talked about a lot, uh, sure. quite a topic of conversation. <laughs> um, and so I started looking into it more um, and I saw that he was training some master's athletes to a great degree of success mm -hmm. um, and Googled his website and said, will you coach me? And he said, yeah, just send the money. So <laughs> <laughs> sure, totally. So uh, that's what happened. Yeah. Awesome. Um, another uh, question I have here specifically on the side of the master's stuff in uh, the United States, we have USA track and field. And they put on events all the way from the junior Olympic level, all the way up through the, the masters and grandmasters. Is that a specific category as well? I believe over super masters, maybe super, something. Well, um, yeah. So all, all the way from, you know, kids in the single digits of age, all the way up into triple digits of age, as we've seen at yeah. different indoor meets, um, some clips go viral from USATF for yeah. somebody who's a hundred years old running a 60 meter or something like that. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more and give a little bit more information to people in the US specifically, because that's what we can talk about for USATF, but how a master's athlete might get involved with competition when it seems like they might not know that it's actually something that they can uh, participate in on a national level. Yeah, um, so there, so the USA track and field, which is the governing body for, for the sport here in the US, has a website. I don't know if it's usatf.org or .com, mm -hmm. um, but they do list all the categories, including the master's categories, all the different events, and you'll be shocked. There is a championship for everything. <laughs> there is, so I love cross country. So there's team cross country nationals mm -hmm. for all age groups in December. Mm -hmm. In January, there's the individual national mm -hmm. championships. Um, and then there's a bunch of road races, everything from and, and track and field from the mile to the half mile to the 15K, everything you can imagine both on the track and on the roads are there, mm -hmm. uh, regionals and national competitions. Um, so that's obviously one source. The other is in most of the major cities in the US, there are masters teams. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved with one, there's actually probably two or three here in the Portland area. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see them at races. They're the ones wearing the singlets with their team's <laughs> logo on them. So you just go up, talk to them afterwards. Um, some are a little bit more focused on the social aspect, right. some on the more competitive aspect. So right. whatever feels most comfortable to you, 
you'll go out with them probably on a Sunday group run. Mm -hmm. If you like the guys, uh, uh, gals, you know, then you'll start training with them. Um, so the, the local races are a great way to find masters runners and teams. Yeah. And the thing that I've seen, um, at least with my experience with USATF, you know, national races, local races, uh, masters, uh, track and field, cross country road racing seems to be something that people can access even if they don't have history running. And it seems like that specifically in the US uh, right now is a great avenue for somebody to get into the sport that might have run in high school, might have run a little bit in college, but they just want to get competitive again. Yeah. So do you, do you think that's the case that gives a um, kind of good avenue for people to be competitive that might not even know that it's there? Yeah, it is. And, and especially cross country because mm -hmm. running is individual, right? You're, you're the only one on your two legs, <laughs> but uh, cross country is great because you're training as a team. Maybe back in your school days, you were running cross country and you kind of, kind of turn back the clock a little bit and you mm -hmm. feel exactly the same way you did when you were 15, 16. Mm -hmm. um, and the competitions are really good because you're not just running for yourself. You're running with a teammate. So you, you might be dragged along by one of your teammates or you might be able to help them along or mm -hmm. you've got a competitor uh, and you're marking that competitor through the race. Mm -hmm. So you're not just time trialing in cross country, right? You're actually going for a position, right. which is fun. That's what racing is all about. So if you're looking for something new or if you miss those good old days of high school, I right. totally recommend um, cross country and especially as a master's. In fact, if I Scroll down here, if I can share my screen again, my goal for 2020. So my big goal this year is actually on cross country. I am mm -hmm. um, one of the slowest guys on my team. We've got some very good runners. Um, and my C goal is just to make the top, actually it can go up to nine or 10 people, mm -hmm. even though it's only the top five that score. So my C goal is just to make the traveling team for mm -hmm. that national championships. And then my B goal is the top seven and the A goal is to actually score, mm -hmm. which is a huge stretch because these guys are very fast. But um, that's, my, that's my singular focus really for 2020 mm -hmm. is cross country as a master's runner. Can you talk a little bit more uh, in depth about the team that you're actually on and uh, maybe uh, the reach that this particular team has worldwide? So yeah, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed because I'm relatively new. I've been with the team a little less than a year. And like I said, I'm one of the slowest. So I'm not a great representative, but I run for the Bowerman uh, uh, team. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people know the Bowerman Track Club because they have a lot of world-class athletes on the women's and on the men's side, mm -hmm. Olympians and even medalists, mm -hmm. um, Olympic medalists. So as pros, uh, it's a great team. They're very well known in the US if, if you're in the sport. They have a juniors program, which is great for kids in junior high and high school, mm -hmm. some elite junior runners uh, that will jump onto their high school team eventually. And they're mm -hmm. some of the best in the nation. Um, and then there's also a master's program. Mm -hmm. So 40 to 50 age group, there's a 50 to 60 age group, which I'll be running with starting mm -hmm. September when I turn 50. And then there is a 60 to 70 age group. Mm -hmm. um, some of these guys are setting national records um, some of them did run for some of the elite division one schools like Stanford and mm -hmm. Northern Arizona university, Oregon. So a lot of them ran for kind of division two or three smaller schools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like the number three guy on my high school team. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm bringing up the, the end. And, uh, but it's great motivating for me because I like to be the worst guy on the team. Um, <laughs> because you can only go up from there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just by you know regression towards the mean, I think I would get dragged along to better performances. Totally. Um, I wanna to touch on uh, one more subject just on the master's side really quick. Uh, can you go back to the age grading and just talk a little bit about age grading? Because this is something yeah. that I feel like uh, more as you get to the master's side, it becomes more important to look at performances over years, like you mentioned, as you are getting older. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, if you're an experienced runner and if you're over 40, it's very hard to contemplate setting lifetime bests. And as a runner, that's kind of what drives you and motivates you to a great extent. So you need to shoot for other goals that are actually interesting to you. And age grading is great because it gives you an apples to apples comparison of you versus, let's say, your 25-year-old self. 
the way it works is for every age and every distance, there's a world record. And the age grade is what percent slower are you or, or how close are you getting to that age group record? So for example, this 513 for the mile. So in 20, when I was 48 years old or 49 years old, um, a 513 would have represented 80% of the way to the world record, which is probably like 420 or something like that. Um, and so you set the age grade based on the world record for that specific age and distance. Um, and then uh, you can learn a few things. So a lot of runners, when they're first starting out, they'll be like 40 to 50%. If you can get all the way up to the 75% age grade, that means that you're probably, if you're in a local race of like 500 people in your neighborhood, if you hit a 75% age grade, you're probably first, second, or third in your age group. If you get to 80, 85%, you're on that top pedestal. You've probably just won your age group. Um, and then if you get all the way up to 90, your national class, uh, and 95% your world class, you're talking about, you know, the top 150 in the world, maybe. Um, and then the world record is 100%. Now, there's, there's various calculators. You can go online if you type age grade calculator. Type in your age, the distance, and your time. You'll see where your age grades are. Um, and it's great for you to compare. So for example, you know, I ran basically a 509 or whatever, um, which was an 80%, 81% age grade, which is equivalent to a 435 if I were at my peak in the 20s and 30s. And my lifetime PR was 437. So with the age grade, I said an age grade uh, personal best uh, last year. And this way it always keeps it fresh. You always can shoot for a personal best. If you just train a little bit smarter mm -hmm. uh, than you did the year before, you're always in the running to set those lifetime bests. Totally. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great way to focus on another type of progression as well, right? Especially, um, you know, if you are running track races, if you're time trialing solo, it gives you maybe that little carrot dangling above your head that you can have that little bit of extra um, goal there too. The thing that I always think is so funny is uh, anytime there's a new world record set um, overall, uh, people you know say like, oh, great, a world record, but there's all these age group world records that uh, potentially um, have a chance to be broken every season. So it makes it more fresh and it makes uh, it more interesting to follow along yeah. with that type of the, uh, performance tracking. The crazy thing is, so Kipchoge's world record, I guess he's 37 or something, but I'm not sure about that. That <laughs> the world record may also be the master's world record. Because your sure. master's when you're 40, he may be 40, right? Sure. So uh, I think that might be the, the world record and the master's world record could be the same thing. Totally, yeah. And then you have uh, you know the guys on the track that are 19 and 20 years old um, setting the super fast, uh, super yeah. fast times. Um, Cool. I think this is a great discussion about the master stuff because I feel like uh, specifically in the U.S., um, you know, since we are a U.S. based company, um, we interact with a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, this might be something that people just aren't aware of is something that they can access. So I think that this is a ton of great, great information uh, for, for people to have. Um, the the last kind of set topic um, we had here, and this pertains to your 2020 goals, mm -hmm. was how are you dealing specifically with the, uh, um, you know, potential race cancellations and different things? Can you talk us through what your 2020 looked like and how you're making adjustments on those goals? So the uh, race cancellations came at a perfect time for me right now. I picked up some kind of injury a couple of months ago. It hasn't been properly diagnosed. Um, I've been guessing and I think I've been guessing wrong and I haven't been able to go see a physical therapist or a doctor. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm actually just building up my aerobic base right now on a bike mostly and doing some walk jogging, uh, because my, my key focus again is the national cross country in December. Right. So I want, I'm building up my aerobic base until about September and then starting real workouts for September, October, November mm -hmm. in preparation for that. Um, so I think actually it's a great time because the races are canceled now. I'm pretty skeptical about these races in September as well, coming back on. Um, and it, I see it as it's freeing me up and I hope it frees up uh, some of the uh, viewers here. You no longer, if you're a marathoner, you no longer have to train for a marathon because there is no marathon. Right. Take something on the other end of the spectrum that you normally do and work on that. So, mm -hmm. you know, 
set, try and set your your mile PR mm -hmm. or 5K if you're a marathoner, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's kind of one thing I would suggest. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, like I said, it's an unusual year in that I'm really focused just on cross country and everything right now is just a build up to that, mm -hmm. which is, like I said, I usually do four different kind of training cycles a year at different mm -hmm. distances, um, but there's nothing to train for. So I'm just gonna continue building that aerobic base because mm -hmm. that's really the key to being a good runner. Um, and I'm doing it through cycling now, but I'll start running again full time pretty soon. Uh, and I've got the luxury of just worrying about my aerobic base between now and, and September. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really going to start building up, you know, the not the intensity, but the duration of my training for the next three or four months. Totally. Yeah, I think that's a great approach. And it's something, um, you know, we've heard a lot of different people in different situations talk about how they're going to, you know, build up to certain things and then maybe adjust those goals and and just keep uh you know a longer term vision um yeah. we we do have two questions uh before we move on to the next topic uh this comes from rebecca mayer uh, she says boston 2019 was hot and humid too so you mentioned uh feeling like you were in around 257 shape on that course yeah uh, you know going out potentially a little bit hard and then uh, having to uh, come in a little bit under the goal. Yeah. Did you adjust power targets at all based on the weather? Um, she also says, I wasn't racing by power yet at that time, but my pace started tanking after the sun came out at mile 13. So yeah. um, I was I was there in Boston as well and it got, uh, it got warm. Everybody was kind of concerned that it was gonna be that really cold and rainy weather and it yeah. kind of flipped at the last second. Yeah, I yeah. So I before I moved to Portland, I was living in Bali, which is right near the equator, you know, in mm -hmm. Indonesia. Uh, and it's all it's hot and humid, three hundred sixty five days a year there. So I was actually focused on the heat index and the humidity at the Boston Marathon. And was watching that as closely as the wind because that year there was a headwind projected until about two days before and shifted to tailwind. Right. And I was actually really concerned because when you mix heat and humidity with a tailwind about the pace of which you're running, that's yeah. the worst possible condition because then you're in a bubble of your own hot air the whole right. way. So I didn't adjust my power, but I did adjust my hydration strategy. Mm. So I made sure it was basically every two miles uh, that I took a full kind of uh, cup of water, mm -hmm. um, which is more than I normally would. Mm -hmm. um, and I blew it that day. Um, I don't think it, it could have, I cramped up a little bit, but I don't think it was from the heat and humidity. I started feeling even back in mile one or two, a little twinge in my quadricep. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was something else. Um, but yeah, normally um, I would suggest if you see heat and humidity, um, you need to scale things back because you can't cheat your heart uh, mm -hmm. and your heart rate is gonna be elevated a few beats per minute. Um, and you can sustain that for a couple of hours if you're a marathoner, but you're not going to be able to sustain it for the whole two and a half, three, three and a half, four hours. Totally, totally. Um, a couple more questions came in. Uh, this one uh, pertains to training. What do you think works better to improve lactate threshold slash critical power for masters runners? A 20 to 40 minute tempo at your 10 mile pace. So maybe somewhere between 50 and 70 minute all out pace, mm -hmm. depending on your ability. Uh, or repeats at 10K pace, like four times eight minutes. So those little bit shorter cruise interval styles or that critical velocity yeah. um, style. What, what's your opinion on that? So, uh, yeah, um, I would say you, if you want to improve your lactate threshold, you have to train at just a little bit faster than mm -hmm. that lactate threshold. Um, and obviously, by definition, you can't hold it for that long. So I like... I like longer intervals. Uh, you could do, you know, four times 10 minutes, something mm -hmm. like that, at maybe a little bit faster than your current lactate threshold. Um, you could do, uh, if you want to go a little bit slower, then I would say probably no slower than your half marathon pace and hold that for, you know, 8K or five miles, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But in general, I would suggest a little bit faster than your lactate um, threshold do longer intervals, 10 minutes or so, um, and don't give yourself too much rest. You wanna keep that kind of heart rate up. So, you know, 60 to 90 seconds 
a light jog in between. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And then a follow-up question um, from the same person here. What about faster training like VO2 max? Is there a training pace that you find would be too fast for masters? For example, mile pace repeats. So getting on the track and hammering, you know, 400s at, at, at your mile. Is there anything that you shy away from on the faster end right now? Yeah, I have not tried to max out my 400s. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would pull every muscle that I didn't even know about that I had sure, in my body sure, sure. at that point. Um, but that's not to say it can't be done. You just have to be careful as a master's runner. You're not as strong as you think you are, especially if you've taken some time off in between. Mm -hmm. A lot of master's runners end up taking off between after college to when their life situation is set again in their, you know, in their mid thirties. So there's probably a 10 or 15 year window that you've missed in many cases. And then you're starting up again in your late thirties and into your forties, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have not been doing a lot of strength training and I mean like weights to, to kind of build up a little bit of uh, muscle mass because you probably lost a lot um, and you haven't worked on your flexibility, Running fast is a recipe for disaster. You are going to pull something or, or injure yourself or something of the sort. So the fastest I ever train right now is, let's see, uh, I do some workouts at my 5K pace mm -hmm. uh, when I'm training for a 5K. Um, but that might be, uh, you know, like a one minute on, 30 seconds off kind of thing. Sure. Um, and not too much of that. Um I'll do striders, like 100 meter striders to warm up or to cool down, which is mm -hmm. a little bit faster, right? It's probably a little bit faster than mile pace. Sure. Um, that's about it. When, one thing that works really well are hill repeats because mm -hmm. you get the same kind of intensity and the same power that you would if you were running fast on the track. But, you know, especially since you're going uphill, uh, the, the impact on your skeletal system, I think, is a little bit less. At least it feels that way. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good way to to kind of get that same kind of intensity while probably slow, slightly lowering the risk for injury. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, we we've talked about a couple episodes on here advocating for adding in hill sprints or hill repeats for people that, um, you know, maybe aren't used to that high intensity yet. It's a great, great way to add those short yeah. bouts of high intensity training. Um, last question here before we go into our last topic, uh, Kevin from LA. Ian, what specific workouts do you do for XC? I notice higher power numbers on grass and softer surfaces for relatively same efforts. Do you notice the same? The live run people miss you, Kev. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is where stride really shines. So if you're only running on a track or you live like in Chicago and it's flat, your power is pretty constant, right? Because mm -hmm. it's one of the factors is, is either the surface or the incline or decline. Sure. So for cross country training, you have to be a strong runner, which means you have to continually train, train on undulating surfaces mm -hmm. or undulating uh, grades mm -hmm. and different surfaces. Um, but it's pretty hard to kind of dial in what effort you're running. Because if you're running up a wood chip path mm -hmm. uh, and you're feeling like you're running much slower than you would on a 5K on the road, you may actually be working a lot harder. Um, and that's where I really kind of focus on power because mm -hmm. I will run on trails on wood chip paths that go like this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to focus on power there um, and in the races as well, as much as I can um, use that same power target. Now cross country, like I said, is a little bit different because you are marking people. So right. you have to be willing to be a little bit flexible, right. but in general for those kinds of races and definitely for training, really focus on just figuring out what intensity you want in terms of power and just run that on all different kinds of crazy surfaces. It's, it's really fun. Absolutely. Um, last topic uh, I have here that I wanna talk to you about. Um, like we mentioned, you have a YouTube channel where you do running tech mm -hmm. uh, reviews. You talk a lot about um, how you design training plans. So we will definitely put a link in the description for that channel as well. But can you tell us your experience with different running technology and how you go about um, just looking at your training, uh, whether that's planning out training, during training, what watch are you looking at? Are you looking at a watch right now uh, when you're coming back to running? Can you talk just a little bit more about that? Yeah. So so I'm a techie, right? Uh, ever since I graduated from college, I've always been in the tech industry. Uh, 
And I love new technology, but I'm not one of those people that just buy technology for technology's sake. Yeah, it needs to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so I started using GPS watches with the Forerunner 305. This is right around 2005. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that big twinky one, but it wasn't so small either. Sure, that sure, red sure. and silver one with yep. a big bump on it. Yep. So that I started in 2005 with that. I also use heart rate training. Uh, my dad's a cardiologist, but he never trained with heart rate, but I thought maybe it might be interesting to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, so I started with that in, in the mid 2000s. Before that, it was just a digital watch. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was pretty early convert into power uh, and stride because I, you know, I would be, I'm a casual fan of Tour de France and, you, you know, it's been part of the Peloton mm -hmm. uh, power for since the late 90s, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's obvious if it's working for them, uh, we dinosaurs as runners, it, it will work for us eventually, too. Right. Sure. Um, so I use all of those. But at the same token, um, I don't want to become a slave to the numbers mm -hmm. already in cycling. People talk about how boring it is because people are just riding to a number. Sure, power sure, number sure. and they're not even looking up right, right? and it's very a robotic room off the front just staring staring at the yeah generator. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not not compelling tv sometimes sure. so um so i don't want to be a slave to it so actually right now what i've been doing is on ebay for four dollars 95 cents i got my <laughs> 2005 casio and i will be doing a review on this sure um it's fun right just going back to the basics um mm -hmm intensity and duration. So you measure the time and intensity, how you feel. Mm -hmm. as, as you become more and more experienced, like Evan, I'm sure you can go to a track and if someone says run a 75 second lap, you'll be within two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. Then they'll say run a 80 second lap and you'll be within two or three seconds, right? You, yeah. you, you start getting the feel for it. So Definitely. I think that's important too. One thing that I've been doing, which marries the best of both worlds mm -hmm. is I've been using stride without a watch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know if a lot of people know, but Stride will record if you just got the, the foot pod on. When you come back to your home, you can actually manually sync it mm -hmm. uh, to your power center account. And you'll get the whole report of your run, which is great because, you know, that's the beauty of technology. It can record all of your workouts and you get the diary. But I can I call it free running because I can just run just by feel. How do I feel on that given day? But then I have the benefit of going back home and seeing exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really recommend this uh, every once in a while. Don't be a slave to the numbers. Take off the watch, put the stride on, go out and, and see how you did at the mm -hmm. end of the run. That was one of my uh, favorite things, you know, when I was training for a big marathon buildup, if I had a, you know, a, a four mile loop, 30 minute loop, and I had to go out and do a double, I really didn't want to look at my watch and have to go through the mental effort of like even that tiny little thing of just putting that extra little piece on maybe yeah. makes it so I don't get out the door. So just go out and run and do the thing. Um, but when you put stride on, you can just track it. It's a great, great little yeah. benefit there. Um, you, you don't get the GPS map obviously, but you get the thing that you get privacy that matters. You, you, you get the privacy for sure. Um, did you have any other thoughts on, uh, technology and your, your use of stride, anything else you wanted to share? Um, like I said, I, I, I love technology. Um, there, there always needs to be a healthy mix, right? You don't want to be totally focused on the tech. It takes mm -hmm. the fun out of running. Um, your head's down instead of head's up. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a place for it, but you don't want to become a slave to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, the other thing I look at is the future. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about the possibility of, you know, heads up displays, whether they're mm -hmm. contact lenses, not only to see your metrics, but the thing I hate is in races, uh, especially if you're an age group runner, you have no idea where you are relative to everyone else in your age group. Mm, Wouldn't it be true. nice to know that you're in third place with half a mile to go and a chance to get on the podium? Or <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So we need technology like that that gives us real-time feedback um, in the race situation that I think can make racing even more entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, so I look forward to those kinds of things, and I'm always on the lookout to see who's doing what because uh, mm -hmm. there's some interesting stuff in the works. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're early days still for that kind of stuff.
Totally. Um, last question we have that just rolled in here. Can you talk about any recovery techniques that you use in your own personal training, especially, um, you know, I feel it as I've gotten older, I, I feel like I've aged decades uh, just in a couple of years of, of training yeah. and recovery is an important thing, but can you talk specifically about your personal recovery strategies? Yeah. So I don't do that very well. <laughs> So I wish I could tell you that, yeah, I drink, you know, I drink the exact amount of electrolytes and protein after, and then I roll out and then I stretch and I, I'd be lying. So um, there, I'm starting to do a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first injury I've had really that's kept me out for more than four or five days in years and years and years. Uh, so I'm trying to be a little bit smarter about that. Um, I'm doing mostly prehab. Uh, so I'm starting to do a lot of body weight stuff, uh, and a little bit of stretching. Um, I'm not doing probably what I should, uh, mm -hmm. for recovery afterwards. So I don't want to suggest anything because, uh, I'm probably the last person to ask about that. I'm, I'm a big fan, although I shouldn't be right now of coming in the door, sitting down on the couch and just looking at my phone for about 20 <laughs> minutes. So, um, I know that's the exact opposite thing of what I'm supposed to do, but the, um, yeah. I guess one little side topic really quick, you mentioned prehab. I feel like that term specifically has gotten so much more popular over the past two or three years of pre-run, pre-athletic activities that, that yeah. you can do to kind of engage muscles. That's kind of the, the, the buzzword now is that, that yeah. prehab. Um, yeah. Could you give one or two examples of something you might do before you do an athletic activity now? Yeah, this is interesting. I remember reading a post on Let's Run a couple years ago asking why are Masters runners so bulky, right? Because, <laughs> you know, the best, the best uh, kind of 20 and 30 year old runners are super skinny, sure. uh, but the best Masters runners look like they're weightlifters. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's because we lose a lot of testosterone and bone density as we get older. So you, you need to work out to recapture some of that testosterone, et cetera, mm -hmm. and it pays benefits. So I think especially for masters runners, um, strength is really important. So I'm working uh, on the usual things. So the core, so, so kind of the abdomen, my hips, especially uh, gluteus maximus, mm -hmm. that area. Uh, just doing a lot of body weight training. I've got today from Amazon, my, my resistance bands are coming in. Nice. So now I can add a little bit of more uh, resistance to that training. Um, and I like to do stretching. I know there's a kind of discussion on, you know, on leg stiffness and do you want to have loose muscles, tight muscles, whatever. Sure. But I'm finding right now when I, when I look at myself running a video, it doesn't look like how I remember when I was 20 years old. Mm. That's because I'm not getting that hip flexion. So I really focus on that this year is really get a full range of motion from the hip. I want to mm -hmm. increase my stride length uh, and really extend. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't do that if your hips are tight. So that's my area of focus right now. Totally. Awesome. I think that is a great place to end on. Um, can you tell us where people can find more information about you if they're curious about the tech reviews you've done, looking at some of the different training discussions you've done? Where are you on uh, social media? Yeah, so you can find me in a couple of places. Uh, on YouTube, I have a channel called Running Otaku. Otaku is the Japanese word for nerd, uh, the running nerd gone amok, right? Um, so a YouTube channel, uh, also on Instagram, um, and uh, most active on Strava. So mm -hmm. Ian Berman or Running Otaku, if you search for me, uh, you'll find me, and you can follow me on, uh, on this progression to hopefully uh, uh, national cross country. <laughs> Uh, participation at the end of the year. Absolutely. We are so excited for you. Um, I I am very, very thankful for you coming on today. I think people got a lot of information about this, uh, specifically the master's side, I think is something, you know, we hadn't really touched on, but I think it's super helpful for a lot of people watching. So we definitely appreciate it. Um, that wraps it up for this episode. We'll be back with a, another one shortly for now, Ian. Uh, best of luck with your uh, you know, transition back to running and everything. It's yeah. a good time of the year to, to get back into it. I definitely think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Well, we will be back with another episode shortly for now. This wraps up this stride for the love of running episode. See ya. All right, everyone.